morning, everyone. Welcome to MHIFCB Grand Rounds. Um, as we do every uh, November at this time, we're supposed to, next week, we're supposed to be the American Heart Association. We were all supposed to meet in Dallas, but because of COVID and everything, it's a virtual meeting. But one of the annual things we do here is uh, we present <clears throat> ahead of time some of the research offered by the fellows and students that are going to be presented at, at uh, AHA to highlight their work. And so today we have five uh, presentations just to show the breadth and scope of the work that's going on at MHIF. Uh, so we'll get started. So um, our first presenter is uh, Angela Phillips. She's a second year uh, resident here in internal medicine at uh, the Abbott Northwestern Hospital Program and she works with uh, Dr. Miedema. So Angela. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Phillips. Like, I, like he said, I'm a second year internal medicine resident here at Abbott and I uh, I want to give a thanks to everyone who put today together, giving me the opportunity to speak, and Dr. Miedema for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. And so we'll just dive right in. We looked at the observed versus predicted 10-year cardiovascular event rates in a rural population uh, taking part in a population-based health program. So just a little background. The current guidelines recommend that we use the pooled cohort equation to estimate 10-year cardiovascular risk. Uh, and the estimating 10-year risk has become an important part of the patient provider discussion, especially from a preventative and primary care perspective, around primary prevention. However, there were some early critiques of the pooled cohort equation in this body of literature that started to show that the pooled cohort equation was actually suboptimally calibrated uh, to predict risk in modern populations, which could end up having a significant impact on the discussion that we have with our patients regarding the necessity and importance of primary prevention. And so we were particularly interested in looking at how well calibrated the pooled cohort equation was in a modern agriculture-based rural population that was specifically undergoing a population-based cardiovascular disease prevention program. And we anticipated that the pooled cohort equation would overestimate cardiovascular risk in this specific population. And so we analyzed the difference between the predicted and observed event rates for individuals participating in the Heart of New Ulm project. In the Heart of New Ulm project, the details can be seen in table one, but it's essentially a, a population-based program aimed at reducing cardiovascular, modifiable risks for cardiovascular disease in the rural population of New Ulm, Minnesota. Uh, and so part of the, the Heart of New Ulm project, they conducted over 100 baseline screening events and we were able to use the data from this, these screening events to calculate the predicted risk um, at 10 years via the pooled cohort equation. And so that's how we got our predicted risk. And then we used EHR and then the state death data to determine our observed rates for MI, stroke, and CV related death. And so our study population totaled nearly 3,000 individuals aged 40 to 79 who did not have any cardiovascular disease at baseline and who we had enough data to calculate and uh, a 10 year risk with the pooled cohort equation. And so what we our study population was, had a similar number of males to females, was predominantly white with 99.2%, had a low prevalence of smoking, a low prevalence of diabetes, and a higher prevalence of hypertension and hyperlipidemia, and then also had presumably higher access to health care, given that most of our individuals were insured. And so as you can see in figure one, uh, our predictions were correct in the sense that for the total screening population, the average observed event rates were much lower than what was predicted by the pooled cohort equation. And this was consistent across both men and women. And here we see the greatest difference in men. And then we also, and this was also consistent across all risk categories. Uh, I think particular attention needs to be paid to that greater than 7.5% because this is the point in which the discussion regarding primary prevention uh, becomes most important, because this is our threshold for starting aspirin and statins, and this is when we saw the greatest discrepancies between our observed rates and our predicted rates from the pooled cohort equation, and this was consistent for both men and women. And so taking a second to talk about our Limitations to the study, New Ulm, Minnesota is predominantly white population, and so it's difficult to know whether or not these uh, results would uh, generalize to a more diverse population. And Minnesota is known to have a higher, uh, typically higher access to health care, and so these individuals possibly had more access to primary care providers, 
to work on compliance and reminders of healthcare and lifestyle modifications. Um, and so it's difficult to know if this would be more generalizable into a, a state that has less access to healthcare. Uh, and so from in our sample of individuals that were particularly going participating in a CBD risk prevention program, our observed cardiovascular rates were substantially lower than our predicted from the pooled cohort equation. Uh, and so this is an, the limitations of the pooled cohort equations. It's important to include these in our risk benefit discussion that we're having with our patients regarding the necessity and importance of primary prevention, especially in the setting of polypharmacy, uh, especially in rural populations where cost might be an issue, especially if they're on diabetes medications. Um, and so it's important to keep this in mind so we have accurate and full conversations with our patients regarding the importance of uh, primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. Um, it's also worth noting that these individuals were undergoing specific program to reduce cardiovascular risk. So it could speak to the, the, the success of a program in, in New Ulm, Minnesota. That's all I have. Can I ask a quick question before we go to the next one? Oh. Um, so, so, quick question. So, the population you studied is the one who participated in the meetings, the, the screening meetings? Yeah. Yep. Those patients. Yep. So, do you have information on the people who didn't participate? Are the event rates lower than those people? Because that might be another comparison that might even help make the argument. Yeah, so we don't. And so, that would kind of be the next step is if, if this is reproducible in a, in a population that was not actively undergoing programs to reduce cardiovascular the risk. Of the total population of the city that you, that you have included? Yeah, that's uh, correct. We have event rates for all of New Ulm, and we have event rates for the people that showed up at the New Ulm screenings. So you can kind of do a little bit of subtraction and kind of look at indirectly who didn't show up for the screenings, and they're definitely higher risk. Okay. But there's bias both ways because the people that show up for these screenings often tend to be healthier in general. So, mm -hmm. um, and so was it the intervention that did it or the fact they're healthier to begin with? Probably a combination of both. Congratulations, great study. Thank you. All right. So our next talk is going to be delivered by uh, Dr. Judith Carasconi, and I hope I said that somewhat close. Uh, she, she's uh, with us, uh, visiting with us from Hungary. She's now one of our uh, scholars in the Center for Coronary Disease, working with Bhavana and, uh, and Manos. And I think you have two talks? Yes. All right, so she's going to give us uh, two talks, one on the outcomes of patients with uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction with previous bypass, and then another uh, update on the uh, Progress CTO uh, multi-center registry. So thank you for the opportunity to present here on this grand rounds in the morning. Uh, my name is Judith Karachin, and I'm a research fellow working with Dr. Balakis, as Dr. Troyer said. And uh, the first topic is the outcomes of patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction and history of prior coronary artery bypass graft surgery. These are our co-authors. I do not have any disclosures. So to start with, the outcomes of STEMI patients with prior cavity surgery have received limited study. And we mentioned here three prior studies. Um, the first one was published in the year 2000, the PAMI-2 trial by uh, Dr. Stone. Um, there he found that the uh, six-month mortality uh, compared uh, between the prior cabbage and the no prior cabbage group was worse in the prior cabbage group. Um, after that, another study in, in 2016 came out by um, Dr. Iqbal and his colleagues, which found uh, the similar initial results, so uh, worse mortality results with the prior cabbage group, um, uh, but then they did um, propensity matching analysis, and this, um, this difference didn't show up after that. And the third study, which I would like to mention, is um, from our group in 2014, published in the Jack Cardiovascular in Interventions. Um, here we found that uh, death uh, in hospital, the, the outcomes at 30 days and at one year were not different between the two groups, but uh, death at five years were worse in the prior cabbage group. So to start with, um, the Midwest STEMI Consortium is a multi-center uh, prospective study which has four large STEMI centers enrolling uh, STEMI patients. Mm, they show real-world data. Our analysis is based on the level one, uh, level one analysis. Um, these are data from the Minneapolis Heart Institute patients. 
the, re the details of the statistical analysis are listed here. So um, between March 2003 and April 2020, 6,311 STEMI patients were enrolled um, in the study, and we divided them to two groups based on the, if the patient had a prior cabbage surgery or not. Um, the patients with prior uh, cabbage surgery represented 434 patients, and this meant 6.9% of the population. So our objective was to compare the clinical and procedural characteristics and outcomes uh, between these patients. So let's have a look at the results. Uh, first, the baseline clinical characteristics. Um, we can see that overall the age of the patients were 63 years old and 71% of them were male. When we compare the two groups, um, the patients with prior cabbage were older. They were more likely to have uh, different comorbidities such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, uh, previous MI. Um, cardiogenic shock at the uh, presentation were also more common. Um, in the prior cabbage group, um, but anterior MI was more common in the non-prior cabbage group. When we have a look at the angiographic characteristics, we can see that the, the timiflow pre and post PCI was wor worse between the uh, prior cabbage group, but the CK, um, the peak, C peak CK and the peak CKMB was worse with the non-prior cabbage group. The length of uh, stay and also the door to balloon time was uh, worse uh, in the prior cabbage group. And here are the clinical outcomes. Uh, uh, the, de the death in hospital at 30 days, one year, and five years were all worse in the prior cabbage group. And the outcomes at 30 days were um, not, uh, didn't show any significant difference between the two groups, but at one year, the outcomes were worse. And uh, after that, we did Cox proportional hazard analysis, and uh, the prior cabbage group uh, showed uh, significantly more mortality in, in the hospital and uh, between discharge and 18 months, but not after uh, 18 months and five years. So here are the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves uh, from the freedom from death and uh, the STEMI patients between the two groups. Uh, we can see that the uh, survival was uh, better in the non-prior cabbage group, and the difference between the two groups uh, was significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. Also, the freedom from MACE was better in the no, non-prior cabbage group, and the difference was also significant with a p-value of uh, 0 0.01, less than 0 0.01. Uh, when we had a closer look at the prior cabbage group regarding the different culprit vessels, so um, if they had native coronary uh, culprit vessel versus um, SVGs and non-culprit vessel, we can see that the survivor between the th three groups didn't change. The statistical difference was not significant and uh, the freedom from MACE was not different between the three groups either. Our study has limitations. It is an, it's an observational study, uh, so susceptible to unmeasured confounding and selection bias, and we didn't have any core lab uh, adjudication. Um, to conclude, early and long-term outcomes after STEMI were worse among patients with prior cabbage compared to patients without prior cabbage, at least partly due to higher risk baseline characteristics. Thank you for your attention. Should we go on to the next topic? Oh, so yes. Medication use pre-event. Do you have? A, did you have that on there? If they're on aspirin, statin, that's what. Yeah. Oh uh, yes. Was it is that okay? So I can pull it up again. Yes. Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, the patients were um, more likely to be on medication if they were in the prior cabbage group. But that was kind of expected because they had the medical attention before. Should we go on to the next topic then? Okay. Um, so the next topic is uh, contemporary in hospital outcomes of uh, chronic total occlusion interventions, an update from the Progress CTO Multicenter International Registry. Here are our co-authors. Still don't have any disclosures. So to start with, CTO PCI is a currently evolving field of uh, interventional cardiology. Um, and we gather data on uh, this type, type of intervention, interventions. Here are the uh, in, uh, worldwide registries um, regarding uh, this procedures. We can see that worldwide, the overall, the technical success is above 85%, as well as the procedural success. And the overall MACE is between 0.6% and 7%, and the overall death rates of these procedures is less than 1%. 
So we did this analysis from the Progress CTO registry, which is a, oops, a prospective uh, multi-center registry. And our objective was to examine contemporary outcomes of CTO PCI by analyzing the data of the registry. We included 7,031 CTO interventions performed in 6,984 patients at 35 participating centers. So here is the map of the Progress CTO registry. We can see that we have over 50 participating centers. Most of them are um, situated in North America, but we have centers in Europe, Asia, uh, North Africa, um, Turkey, uh, and Russia as well. Um, this registry, the data from these registries resulted in 61 publications and 90 conference presentations so far. We are still en uh, enrolling and we are still uh, including uh, new sites in the registry. Here's the uh, details of the statistical analysis which we did. So overall, the technical success in our registry was 85.9%, procedural success was 83.8%, and the overall MACE was 2.06%. When we compared the, uh, the patients uh, who had technical success to the patients who had technical failure, we can see that uh, they were older and they were uh, more likely to have uh, hypertension, prior cabbage surgery, um, heart failure, and uh, prior peripheral vascular disease. Um, the, the most common target vessel was the right coronary artery, compare, uh, followed by the LAD and the circumflex. Um, and the overall JCTO score was uh, 2.41, and the overall progress CTO score was uh, 1.09. We can see that the uh, technical failure group uh, had more complex regions, so they, it resulted in higher JCTO and progress CTO scores. Regarding the crossing strategies, the undergrade wiring was the most common crossing strategy. Uh, more than half of, the pa half of the patients had this successful crossing strategy, followed by the retrograde and the integrate dissection and reentry uh, strategies. When we had a look at the successful crossing strategies stratified by the JCTO score, we can see that as the JCTO score increases, um, other um, crossing strategies uh, were applied. So the retrograde approach was more common in the more complex group. We did the same analysis with progress CTO score, and we can see that as the score is getting higher, the ADR is more common in these patients. So to have a look at angiographic characteristics, we can see that the technical failure group had uh, more complex characteristics, such as more, such as more uh, calcification, proximal vessel tortuosity, proximal cap ambiguity, uh, side branch of the proximal cap, and that these lesions will also longer. Um, here is the summary again of the procedural outcomes. We can see the high technical and the procedural success rates and the acceptable MACE. When we had a look at the different types of complications, um, the overall MACE was 2.06%, as I mentioned before, and the death rate was 0.39%, and the other uh, complications are listed here on this slide. Uh, when we did analysis on uh, JCTO score and progress CTO score with the different outcomes of the procedures, we can see that as we go to more complex lesions, the technical and procedural success is decreasing and the MACE is going up, but even in the very complex lesions, uh, the results are quite promising. Our study has limitations. It's an observational registry without adjudication and the QCA analysis, and these procedures were performed by experienced CTO operators limiting extra extrapolations of the results to less experienced centers and operators. So to conclude, using a combination of, of crossing strategies, high success and acceptable complication rates can be achieved in CTO PCI among various centers and patient populations. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, that was great. All right, moving along here. Our next speaker is Ilias Nikolakopoulos, who joined us uh, from Athens uh, what, a little over a year ago and is part of the, as a scholar in the Coronary Disease Center working with Manos and Bhavana. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about um, randomized trial of transradial versus transfemoral in patients uh, with previous bypass. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Trevor, for the introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me here to present uh, the work of our team. 
And uh, the topic of vascular access in prior cover patients has been uh, the topic of two randomized trials to date. First of all, it was the radial cabot trial that showed that radial access is uh, inferior to femoral access in regards to contrast use, procedure time, uh, crossover, and radiation exposure. But this year, the L-record uh, study came along and showed that uh, radial is not inferior to uh, femoral in all those aspects. In addition, there has been observational data that show that there may be less uh, vascular access complications with uh, the radial uh, approach in those patients. Why uh, a large portion of cardiologists prefer uh, femoral access to be used in patients with prior cabots, but there are also uh, many people that advocate for the use of radial uh, approach in these patients, and that is why we have the radial versus femoral debate extending into those patients as well. And uh, that is why we perform this meta-analysis to ask this exact question, uh, that in patients with prior uh, bypass surgery that undergo angiography plus or minus PCI, is femoral or radial axis associated with better outcomes? For that, we did a PubMed search, we did a clinical trials.gov search, we searched the Cochrane Library, we also looked for um, conference abstracts from the major meetings, and we also asked, we requested data for the prior cabot subgroup from the four largest access, vascular access trials in cardiology. We included every study that um, had information uh, for at least one of our outcomes of interest, Procedure time, contrast, volume, crossover rate, and access site complication. Uh, so we identified 760 articles along with three abstracts, and uh, we uh, finally got data from one of the four randomized trials that we uh, asked data from. And that makes for a total of 21 studies uh, included in the analysis. And the analysis itself comprised of uh, bias analysis, a frequent distance meta analysis with meta regression, and also Bayesian meta analysis. Uh, in terms of bias, all of our RCTs had uh, a low uh, risk of bias, and also the observational study scored um, mostly six or seven in the Newcastle Ottawa scale, which means that significant bias was probably absent. Um, publication bias was also absent, at least from the access complications endpoint, uh, but was present for uh, crossover rate, procedure time, and contrast volume. Uh, and we then divided our studies to randomized studies and non-randomized studies, and we pre uh, performed the meta-analysis. Uh, for randomized studies, uh, there was no difference in vascular access complications, no difference in procedure time, and also in contrast volume, but there was a higher crossover rate uh, in the radial group um, in those patients. And with, uh, uh, for the observational studies, there was uh, radial access was actually associated with a lower uh, rate of uh, vascular access complications, lower contrast volume uh, use, uh, contrast use, higher crossover rate again as in randomized studies, uh, and the procedure time was uh, finally similar. There was significant heterogeneity in almost every endpoint, especially in observational data. And that is why we also conducted the meta-regression analysis to try to explain that. Unfortunately, none of the variables that we included in the model were available to us by the original studies. Um, could possibly explain the great degree of variance. And there was also high residual heterogeneity, which means that um, essentially there were other parameters other than the ones, uh, parameters other than the ones we captured that uh, could explain the variance between the studies. Um, finally, we performed the random effects based in meta analysis. We used the non informed prior, and uh, judging by the base factor BF10, uh, we can tell that for vascular access complications, um, it was 2.5 times more likely for a difference between radial and femoral to exist than to not exist. And for crossover rates, um, it was 5.4 times more likely for a difference to exist than not. Uh, judging uh, uh, based on this scale here, though, both base factors were uh, on the low end of the spectrum, which means that the evidence of a difference existing between those two is moderate at best. Um, and from the analysis, the same analysis, there was no evidence that a uh, difference exists between uh, radial and femoral with regards to procedure time and uh, contrast value. Uh, our study was limited by the publication bias, moderate to high heterogeneity in many endpoints. And to conclude, most data published uh, today uh, are observational uh, in that topic of access in paracabot patients. And we found that radial access is associated with lower uh, vascular access complication rates and contrast volume in observational studies, uh, and higher rates of crossover in both observational and randomized studies. And according to Bayesian analysis, 
the evidence of a difference between radial femoral is weak to moderate. Um, we are trying here at MSIF to contribute to that uh, strategy of randomized data and produce more. And uh, we're doing the rebirth trial, which recruits uh, patients that don't have a STEMI and compares radial and femoral axis. Um, we have enrolled 60 patients to date, and with a target a little bit upwards of 3,200 patients, and we have included patients with prior tablets, and we hope to include more. Um, so while we wait for randomized data to arrive, uh, the debate is going to continue. Uh, but as it, as it has been said, it is probably better to debate a question without selling it than to settle a question without debating it. Thank you. Any questions for Ilya? All right, we're moving right along. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Chase Sukup, who I had the pleasure of uh, working with. Uh, he is a former graduate from uh, Notre Dame and is now in his first year of medical school at the university, so that's something we're always proud of. Uh, with our uh, summer research program that a lot of the kids that come and work with us do great things and helps them get into medical school. So, Chase, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Trapper. Uh, yeah, so as Dr. Trapper said, um, my name is Chase Sukup, uh, and I was his intern a couple of summers ago here at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. Um, and the research that we did together was on incomplete revascularization following cabbage. Now here's just a little bit of a roadmap of, of where I'm going today. Um, the title of our project was the rate of incomplete revascularization following cabbage in 2007 versus 2017 at a single institution. Um, I'm going to go really quickly through the background. Um, so here we just have a patient with uh, a total occlusion in their, in their right coronary artery, 70% stenosis in their LAD, and then 95% stenosis in their circumflex. And then here is the same patient. Uh, this heart is like a cartoon version of that heart, and the stenoses are shown in purple uh, rectangles. And so this patient goes in for cabbage and the lima is placed to the LAD and then a couple of reverse saphenous vein grafts to the RCA and circumflex. And because all of these um, are revascularized, we would call this complete revascularization. And so here's another patient. Again, they have total occlusion in their right coronary artery, 70% stenosis in their LAD and then 90% stenosis in the ostium of, uh, let's say this is a large first diagonal and supplying a significant amount of the myocardium. And so this patient, again, goes in for cabbage, uh, the lemus placed to the LAD, and then a reverse saphenous vein graft to uh, the right coronary artery, but that diagonal is missed, um, and so we would call this incomplete revascularization. And so cabbage uh, has been shown to, to likely have um, an, a mortality advantage compared to PCIs um, in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease, and uh, especially in patients with diabetes. And of these patients that undergo cabbage, it's estimated that up to 50% of them um, have incomplete revascularization. And it, this is a big deal because incomplete revascularization is associated with 30% increase in mortality, a 22% increase in MIs, and a 26% increase in repeat revascularization. And so given that um, complete revascularization has this mortality and morbidity advantage over obviously incomplete revascularization, um, it's important that complete revascularization is achieved whenever possible. And so our goal was to estimate uh, the rate and the degree of incomplete revascularization in 2007 and 2017 here at Abbott, uh, and then to characterize the main reasons for incomplete revascularization. So we did a retrospective review of patients that underwent um, multivessel coronary, that had multivessel coronary artery disease and underwent cabbage um, here at Abbott uh, in 2007 and 2017. And in 2007, uh, we had a total of 581 patients, 291 of which came, uh, had cabbage in 2007, 290 had cabbage in 2017. Um, and so what we did is we went in and reviewed their angiograms and their heart diagrams um, and looked at things like vessel stenosis severity. Um, and if those vessels were deemed suitable for bypass, we also recorded uh, different patient factors and um, less left ventricular ejection fraction for cabbage and then at least six months post cabbage. Uh, and then we also recorded death and cause of death. Um, and then we went in and looked at the cabbage operative reports um, to see whether these, these vessels were bypassed um, by either a, a neighboring vessel or, or by the cabbage surgery. Um, and we recorded things like uh, whether it was on or off bypass. In order to assess the, the degree of incomplete revascularization, we came up with an anatomically based uh, scoring system, which we called re the revascularization index score. And this was a little bit more comprehensive 
than what we had seen in, in previous studies, um, because most previous studies just look at the, main, the, the three major epicardial vessels, so the LAD, uh, the circumflex, and the right coronary artery, and we wanted to include major branch vessels that are supplying a significant amount of myocardium. Um, so the way we scored this is regardless of the size for the major epicardial vessels, if they had a stenosis greater than 60%, um, then they were given one point if they were revascularized and zero points if they were not. Uh, and then for the major side branches, they were scored in the same manner, but this was based on size. So the, for the first diagonal and the ramus intermedius, if they had a diameter greater than two millimeters and they were more than 50% of the LED length, um, then if they had a, st a significant stenosis greater than 60%, uh, then they were given one point if revascularized, zero points if not. And then for the posterior lateral branch and other major octus marginal branches, it was all based on the diameter. So a patient with complete revascularization would have been somebody who has uh, all the major epicardial vessels and their major branch vessels uh, that had a significant stenosis and for the branch vessels that, that, that they met a certain size requirement. Um, they had to be either bypassed directly or indirectly via perfusion from a neighboring vessel. And if they were, uh, this was complete revascularization and we gave them an RIS of one. Uh, now let's say that the patient had four stenoses again and three of those were bypassed, then we would give it three out of four, so it would be an RIS of 0.75. So here are our results. Um, of the 291 patients in 2007, uh, 52 of those cabbage operations were classified as 17.9%. And then there was a large increase uh, in 2017 of these 290 patients, it was 82 of them, or 28.3%. So there was a significant uh, increase in incomplete revascularization over this 10 year period. Um, here's a table comparing the two groups in total. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna break just break these down in a couple of slides to come and just focus on the numbers that reach significance. So the 2017 cohort, cohort was older by a couple of years and consisted of more males, but we didn't notice any difference in uh, things like diabetes or smoking. Uh, there was almost a 50% reduction in off-pump cabbages um, between 2007 and 2017. And then when we looked at mortality, um, no patients died within the first year uh, after their cabbage in 2007, but eight patients died in the first year following cabbage uh, for those patients that had cabbage in 2017. And of those eight deaths, uh, six were deemed to, have, uh, to be cardiovascular related. Uh, here's another table, and this time it's just comparing the patients that uh, had incomplete revascularization. So again, for the sake of time, I'm gonna break down just the numbers that reach significance. Um, as far as baseline demographics go, we didn't notice any difference in, in age or sex or um, diabetes or smoking, um, and this could be due to uh, the relatively smaller sample size when it comes to just the patients with incomplete revascularization. But even then, the only number that was even pushing significance um, was age. Um, and then when we looked at the revascularization index score, it dropped from 0.73 to 0.67. So not only did the rate of incomplete revascularization increase, but the degree of it worsened. Uh, the left internal mammary artery was used as a graft. Uh, 97% of the time in 2017, so that number went up. And then ejection fraction before cabbage was, no, was not different between the two groups. But following cabbage, um, it was uh, higher. It went from 53 to 56.9. Uh, here's a Kaplan-Meier curve of the 10-year survival rates just for the patients in 2007. And you can see that um, the, the red line is the patients that had incomplete vascularization. Um, the, the, uh, their survival rate is, is decreasing more rapidly. However, this number did not reach significance. Uh, the most common vessels missed that we saw were the obtuse marginal followed closely by uh, the PDA and then uh, the diagonal. Uh, and this was in line with what we had seen in previous studies. And the most common reasons given uh, was that the vessels were too small or had diffuse disease throughout their length. Uh, so to conclude, our, our study was the first uh, to describe the temporal changes in complete revascularization following cabbage. Um, and we saw that the, the rate and degree of incomplete revascularization has, has significantly increased over 10 years. Um, between 2007 and 2017, uh, despite a decline uh, in off-pump surgeries. And potential reasons for this are likely multifactorial. Um, it could be related to certain patient factors like age, um, and it could also be due to like, things like previous uh, PCIs. Um, but regardless, um, patients with incomplete revascularization obviously are, are an important target uh, because they have um, higher rates of incomplete revascular, or of, uh, excuse me, of cardiovascular risk. Um, and so they represent an important target for uh, novel therapies like neovascularization and collateral blood flow development. I'd like to thank, thank Dr. Travers again uh, for our work that summer, and uh, as well as ben, uh, Dr. Sun 
uh, Ross Carmen Christian, and then Flannan Diane Hickok, who funded my internship. Thank you. It was a great study, actually, uh, and it fits with the clinical impression that we have from what's happening. Uh, what would be great, actually, to have the explanation? Is it just a choice, or was there a real, like, stance or something? Like, that would be actually a great piece of information. Because my feeling is a lot of this actually was a choice, not a mandate. I don't know if that's possible to look at the data, but that might help uh, clarify this one. Yeah, I, I agree. I think one of the, the issues is, is, unfortunately, the operative report, we, you know, the surgeons aren't very open about their mindset of why they didn't. Usually they'll just say it's too small or too diseased, and then they just leave it like that. So um, Maybe we should share this information with them. Yeah. <laughs> could you look at whether or not what didn't get bypassed could have been stunted? So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we did, no. Because I guess the question would be is, you know, was this just, were these vessels that nobody could have done anything with and we just have a different patient population now? If the majority of these were with the right coronary arteries, most PDA was the most common vessel not bypassed. So, um, and uh, <clears throat> often, um, you know, it tends to be a very diffusely diseased vessel, probably not usually ideal, a lot of times CTO, so not ideal for like a hybrid approach where you throw a lima, you know, to the LED and then fix with the other vessels you can that are usually a lot more suitable for PCI. Great job, Chase. Thank you. Nice. It's, uh, and Chase, uh, just to say Chase's eye abstract here was just temporary or uh, provisionally accepted by American Journal of Cardiology. So, uh, He's working on that to get that all, uh, hopefully it'll be published then early uh, next year, so. All right, our last talk is uh, by uh, Dr. Evi Bemu, who uh, is visiting us from Greece, who's uh, uh, also a, a coronary disease uh, scholar. Uh, and uh, she's gonna talk today about learning and innovation among interventional uh, cardiologists uh, following a, a really interesting survey that she conducted. Thank you, Dr. Travers. Thank you, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here to present today uh, the results of our study regarding learning and innovation among interventional cardiologists. I have no relevant disclosures. As a background, what is innovation? Innovation is defined as a new idea, method, or device, or alternatively, the introduction of something new. A willingness of interventional cardiologists to adopt innovation and implement changes in day-to-day -day practice has received limited study. That is why we conducted an online survey involving 38 questions that we distributed via email list to interventional cardiologists. The survey lasted one month, so from April 17th to May 18th, and we sent two reminder email, uh, emails to increase our responses. The software we used was SurveyMonkey. So we had 621 uh, responses, so the response rate was about 9%. The majority of the respondents were from 35 to 54 years old, 4% were fellows in training. Uh, men, um, there were nine out of the 10 survey respondents were men, as it is almost the case in interventional cardiology. The most common type of practice was private practice, followed by university program. Most of the responses came from the U.S., almost, uh, 70, uh, almost 73%, uh, followed by India and other countries like Canada, Greece, Hungary, and uh, Egypt. So the first topic of our survey was equipment, and 86% uh, of the respondents rated themselves as very likely or likely to introduce recently approved equipment in their practice. Almost 50% have tried a new coronary guide wire in the past six months, and 52% uh, have tried new equipment for lesion preparation in the past six months. The most commonly used devices were rotational atherectomy, followed by cutting balloon. Having said that, barriers to innovation and uh, hesitation to use uh, new equipment do exist. Uh, and 
the most commonly cited was high cost, followed by uncertainty as to whether new equipment provides additional benefit uh, compared to the currently used one. A second topic of our survey was vascular access. So we asked the respondents to say how often they used uh, radial access for STEMI. The responses could be always, uh, often, sometimes, rarely, or never. So 43% uh, of the respondents said they always use radial access in STEMI. And regarding femoral access, it was interesting that 32% uh, uh, said they always use ultrasound guidance when performing femoral access. 91% of the survey respondents have used a closure device in the last six months. The most commonly used devices were angioseal and perclose. So in order to keep up to date and, learning, and learn new techniques, the preferred method by the survey respondents was reading journals. And in order to learn something new, the preferred method was uh, workshop or short course attendance, um, cited by more than 70%. Uh, followed by proctorship and reading. Social media were lower in that uh, scale. Regarding journals that interventional cardiologists read in order to keep up to date, the most uh, preferred ones were from the Jack family of journals, followed by the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, CCI, and Circulation family uh, of journals. Our study has limitations. First of all, it has a low completion rate, less than 10%. Um, there is a possibility of selection bias, meaning that people that tend to be more innovative in their practice completed the survey. The responses might have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in ways that uh, we cannot predict. And there is variability in physician perception and practices among uh, physicians working in different healthcare systems. As a reminder, most of the responses came from the US, but we also had responses from India, Egypt, Greece, Europe, so these are completely different healthcare systems. So in conclusion, 86% uh, of the survey respondents uh, rated themselves as very likely or likely to use recently introduced equipment. However, they cite high cost as the most uh, common barrier. Regarding access, radial access is underutilized in STEMI, and ultrasound guidance is also under underutilized for femoral access. And finally, in order to keep up to date, reading journals and uh, short course attendance were the preferred methods. Thank you very much, everyone at MHIF for making it possible to conduct research during these uh, challenging times. Thank you. Any questions? I remember participating in your survey. So. <laughs> <laughs> you received a lot of emails, probably. <laughs> no, uh, uh, all right. Well, I think that concludes our uh, our six topics. Um, just some really great work by by everyone. Very proud to uh, rep, you know that you're representing MHIF uh, at the American Heart Association, and uh, we look forward to actually seeing these presentations. Uh, online. Uh, I think the meeting starts, uh, what, Friday? Right? Friday through like Tuesday next week. Fortunately, it, it, we won't be in Dallas, but we'll be here. But hopefully next year we'll be uh, uh, at some new location out of here and, and out of the cold weather stuff. Uh, were there any online questions at all? Okay, perfect. Well, thanks everyone for your attending. Thank you.